Hey everyone, this is Prashant and I'll be your host for the VC 10X podcast and today we have Atin Batra with us. Atin is the founder and general partner at 27 Ventures, a global VC fund that invests in edtech and future of work startups. Investing at the earliest stages, pre-seed and seed, Atin looks for outstanding founders who are building big businesses and are nice people, leaving a net positive impact on the world. In this episode, we talk about Atin's story and how he started investing, the Founder Fellowship Program, how Athene adds value to portfolio companies as a solo GP, major sources of deal flow, and some exciting portfolio companies. So without wasting any time, let's dive straight in. Oh wait, if you haven't subscribed to VC10X yet, please do and give us a 5-star rating if you find value in this episode. Now, let's start. Hey Athene, so good to have you on the VC10X podcast. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Prashant, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. So to start things off, can we have your story and how you started investing? Sure. Um, well, I've, uh, you know, all my life I've been trying different things. Um, I did go over to the dark side of corporate um, jobs, but didn't really enjoy that. And, um, you know, as an entrepreneur, um, I always had this idea of wanting to help other entrepreneurs. And the best way that I can do that is to be an, uh, be an investor. And so, uh, about eight years ago, as I was transitioning out of my last um, failed venture, um, I had the opportunity to actually jump across the table and become an investor as part of a, a corporate accelerator. And um, and I just, you know, jumped at the opportunity, grabbed it with both hands and um, have loved venture investing ever since. So now I've been a venture investor for about eight years across three different firms and the most recent being my own. Yep, that sounds great. So basically, you are an entrepreneur turned investor. So how, yeah. how many times did um, you did you start up? It was like multiple oh, times? Multiple times. I mean, I've, I've, it's not just like when I think of an entrepreneur, I, even when I'm thinking about some of the founders that are pitching our, um, uh, for the funds, um, I, when I think of an entrepreneur, I, only, I don't think of that person as just somebody who started a company. You could have started a, a community. You could have started a, a project, right. an event, whatever, right? Like anything that you start yep. from scratch and build from scratch, I think of it as being entrepreneurial. And so in my, in my own um, uh, life, you know, we've done a couple of things. We, um, I um, was uh, a lead um, uh, organizer for a, for a nonprofit, for an educational nonprofit back home in India, Basically, um, so that's been a huge part of my life. Uh, I've started two companies in the past. Um, one was a services agency. One was a tech product. Um, and then the best thing is that here now, even if I'm, even though I'm an investor, technically, it's my own firm. So I am an entrepreneur again in in many ways because I started my own firm um, and built it from scratch. So um, I get to now play actually both sides of that table. I'm an entrepreneur because I started my own investment firm and then I'm an investor because that's my day job. Yeah, for sure. And there are a lot of similarities between being an entrepreneur and being an investor in a VC firm because you have to do the fundraising part. You have to sure. even report to your LPs, right? Absolutely. Like founders report to investors. So a lot of Absolutely. similarities there, yeah. right? I think so, the, the uh, biggest similarity actually is to that point of, of us talking to, you know, doing our own fundraising is the idea of actually um, the sales skill, the skill of selling, you know, that's um, pervasive yeah. across both being a, a tech entrepreneur or a, like a company founder, as well as being an investor, because essentially every single time that you speak to anybody that is external to the company, you're trying to sell yourself. As a founder, you're probably trying to sell your product, your, you know, to employees to potential employees to potential investors to customers and so on is the same thing with me as an investor i'm trying to sell my firm and myself to our potential lps but also to the founders that we we're backing because you know people have choice today it's not like we're the only uh, game in town right like somebody could just as easily raise money for someone else so as a vc we're also selling ourselves to our founders to to get them to trust us and build that relationship so yeah it's i mean that um, this is one of those things I, I say very often, but that's the, the the art of selling and storytelling is something that is required for every single thing that you do in your professional life, whether you're a founder or an employee at a corporate or a VC like me. So find a way to develop that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's let's now talk about 27V, that is sure. your venture fund. So what's the investment thesis here and uh, what, yeah. what makes it different from other funds? Yeah, so um, two things, actually three things we talk about. One is we invest at the earliest stage, please seed and seed. 
Um, we've got on a couple of Series A's, but those are follow-ons. We've never really invested in anything uh, that was beyond a seed um, at a first check. The second thing that sets us apart is our sector focus. So we're focused, we're, we're not generalists. We're very focused on certain sectors. There are two in particular that we do most of our, all of our investing in, which is education and future of work. So edtech and future of work um, are our sectors of focus. The third thing is that we're technically a global firm. Our mandate is to invest anywhere in the world except for China, India, and Africa. All three of those have great local ecosystems, so I'm not going to actually try and understand the cultural nuances of that. But other than those three uh, regions and ecosystems, I'm open to investing anywhere, and that's exactly what it is. Our portfolio spans US, Canada, uh, UK, Israel, Germany, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Singapore, New Zealand, so really all over the place. Um, so that, that's what makes us different is I think I can count on my fingers just how many firms, how many VC firms invest in education at pre-seed and invest, are now open to investing globally. So we're, we're a rare um, firm because of those three things, the intersection of those three things. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's pretty interesting because I believe uh, you spent some time in India as well before you moved over. So uh, but why have you left out India in that investing spectrum? Because the edtech space uh, is pretty hot in here as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I was actually born and brought up in India. So I spent like 25 years in Hong Kong for the last 10 years. Um, no, I, I am not investing in India for two reasons. One, uh, and this is outside of my control, but regulatory requirements. There are certain restrictions that I just cannot meet because I have an offshore fund and, and uh, the Indian government is asking for some disclosures that I can't do. So that's one. Uh, even if I were to find a way around that, um, the reason I've actually left out India is also because um, there is a local ecosystem of investors that are super active. You know, We've got friends at Bloom, we've got friends at uh, the Sequoia team and so on, and they're amazing at what they do. Um, and to actually be successful in India, I feel like you need uh, a team on the ground. You need like boots on the ground. And I, as a solo GP with no employees, I can't really do that. And so it's best for me to focus on stuff that I can do and compete rather than, uh, you know, uh, put resources into India or China or Africa, all three of which I th think of in the same way that there's local ecosystems need uh, cultural nuances from, from a localized perspective, which I can't provide. Yeah, yeah, that certainly makes sense. Uh, all right, let's 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 talk about the Founder Fellowship. I read about it on your website. So yeah. what is it all about? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, I mean, two things that sort of led to the Founder was I was an entrepreneur myself, so I really do understand, you know, what entrepreneurs go through, what founders go through. Um, it's a very isolating uh, job. Like, yeah, when, you're, when you start something of your own, even if you have a co-founder, it still sort of puts you in this bubble where you're constantly um, thinking of an us versus them mentality. And so um, I always felt like it was valuable to have uh, friends and family and, and support system around you. And that support system can be beyond friends and family. And so that's really what we're trying to create with the Founder Fellowship. Um, the second thing that sort of led to that formation was actually Back when I started out as an investor and I and I was the head of this corporate accelerator, um, I came up with this idea of um, doing regular weekly check-ins with all of the companies in one room. And I realized that just by putting everybody in the same room, there was a lot of uh, uh, cross um, collaboration and interplay that was happening that was super valuable to all of the founders. Um, and, and so I took basically both of those things and created this founder fellowship at 27V. The idea being every single week I organize an event. So I've actually hosted over the last three years, every single week I've personally hosted an event uh, for the portfolio to get together at uh, different formats, different topics, different speakers. But it's, uh, I mean, the way that I think about it, it's an excuse for them to learn from each other in the moment, but also build those relationships so that when they do need help with uh, with a certain aspect, they know exactly who to reach out to. We've got a Slack community where people are always messaging each other. So there's always a, a way to, um, you know, broach that subject with somebody else. Yeah, that sounds great. And what does the invest, uh, investment process look like? And how do people apply to get investment from you? Yeah, um, the investment process is super simple. I mean, it's just, I'm a solo GP, so it's easy for me to make decisions rush. So my process is somewhere between three to four weeks, uh, all told from first uh, conversation to a decision. 
Um, the way that I run the process is every single week, I'm trying to answer a specific set of questions. And usually it flows in this manner. The first week is trying to understand the founder story. So just who you are, uh, what's your background? Why are you starting this particular company? The second week is almost always about the product. So what is the product? Who are the customers? You know, what are your unit economics? Those kinds of things. The third one is to try and understand a little bit more about the market. Uh, and when I say market, what I'm trying to figure out is where your competitors, how do you fit in the trends that we're seeing in this particular space and so on. And then the fourth is sort of bringing all of that together and making a, a final decision. But one of the other things that I do, uh, which I've had some good feedback on is every single week I try and do it. Uh, I try and do an email check-in as in at the end of the week, you, if you're somebody who's applying and going through the process with us at the end of the week, you will get an email that says, I like what you're doing. Let's move to the next week and we'll have another conversation or I want to actually just stop this here. We'll pass because of X, Y, and Z reason. So try and make it as transparent for the founders as possible. So that's, that's the, um, uh, the process. And then the best way to apply is, um, is just go to our website. There's a form, there's an Airtable form, just fill that form in. Honestly, even if you sent me an email and lots of people do, I still direct them to the form because the idea is to be um, absolutely fair with every single person coming in. We do lots of investing off of inbounds also. So in fact, we've invested in what, three companies that were inbound, just called inbound. Founders did not know me. They didn't get any introductions. They just applied on our website. And, and we like them so much that we invested. So uh, to be fair to everyone, it's that form that is the number one place to go to uh, to apply for funding. Great, great, great. Yeah, that, that that's a good thing to create a fair ground for everyone and getting everyone in one place because investors get pitches from left, right, and center, Absolutely. and yeah. then it's difficult to collate them at one place, right? Especially if you're uh, a solo right, GP so what... and doesn't have a, an analyst or an associate to do some of the grunt work for yeah. you. So yeah, it makes it super easy for me to just go through that list real quickly. Absolutely. And uh, I've previously hosted some solo GPs on here as well. And uh, I know that there are a lot of challenges to that being a solo GP yeah. because you have to take care of every aspect of running mm -hmm. a firm from fundraising to value add, yeah. basically end to end. So what do you think is like the biggest challenge of being a solo GP? And oh, what are the things that you're looking to outsource, if any? Yeah, that's an easy, easy answer time. Like, I mean, as a solo GP, as if you were a founder of a company, it's, you know, you're always going to be run, running against time. Um, that's always the, the biggest problem. Um, I do actually outsource uh, a couple of things. I've been um, fortunate to have found um, people that I can work with on a regular basis. We've got some contractors that we work with. We've got a PR agency. We've got a fund administrator and so on and so forth. So, so we're very fortunate that we do have uh, people in place to help. Um, but, you know, you're still you're still struggling for time. Yeah, that's always going to happen. Yeah, correct. And talking about founders, so what are you looking for in founders? Uh, are there specific traits that make them a hell yes or a hell no? Oh, um, yeah. I like how you phrase that. So I guess for, for me, a hell yes is um, three things. One, um, entrepreneurial, like have they actually built something from scratch? Um, I it doesn't actually to me it doesn't matter whether you build something in this industry that you that you're now building for or whatever that really doesn't matter it's just do you understand the ups and downs that come with building something from scratch just that uh, that's the first thing the second thing um i i try and gauge um and actually i asked this question right up front what's your superpower like i know what my superpower is so my idea is to understand what is your superpower um it, it gives me a couple of different um, data points. One is I do understand, you know, through your response, I can sort of understand what you're good at and what gaps you need to fill in the team. That's great to, for me to understand, that's, that's one. But the second thing, the more important thing, honestly, is are you self-aware enough to know where your strengths and weaknesses are? Because I don't want somebody who comes in and wants to be this, uh, you know, macho guy or girl who says, no, 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 I know everything and I can cover all bases and I have no weaknesses, no gaps in our team. That's not the mindset that we're looking for. I mean, we're a we're an education focused fund. We like to believe that we're always learning. And, and so one part of that learning is to know exactly what you need to improve on. Um, and so that's the second piece. That's a huge part for me is just to understand um, are you self-aware enough? Um, are you, do you, what's your superpower? Do you understand that? 
The third thing that actually makes anything a hell yes for me is how it fits with my vision of sort of where we're headed. Um, and this has nothing to do with the founder, unfortunately, but sometimes, you know, founders are building companies that are marketplaces, companies that are focused on, uh, well, we had a company yesterday that said that they want to replace college education. Uh, my answer to that is that's never going to happen. So just forget it. Like it's never going to happen. I think there's a, um, there's there's scope to do um, to revolutionize college education. You can make changes. You can improve it. But if you think you're going to replace it, then you're just kidding yourself, and you're kidding all of you know every single person you're speaking to. So um, I think the the third piece for me that makes it a hell yes or a hell no is how it aligns with our vision for what the world is going to be. And it has nothing to do with the founder, but it's just that um, trying to figure out exactly where you fit in this puzzle of what we're trying to build the world to be. Yeah, they make a lot of sense. Uh, all right, so let's talk about deal flow. So from sure. what all sources are you getting getting your deal flow and where does the majority of your deal flow come from? Yeah, it's all, it's all. I mean, uh, everybody has the same answer. It's, we get lots of, um, I think where uh, I try and do something different is be open to inbounds, like actually be open to investing in inbound deals. Like a lot of people just see the inbounds, but then don't actually follow up, but we don't do that. Um, I followed up with every single person who's applied for funding. I've emailed every single person who's ever sent us an email um, asking for for an investment. Um, we've invested in three companies in the portfolio that have been cold inbounds. I didn't know the founder. The founder didn't know me. They applied on our website uh, and just sent us uh, their details. We've invested in them. And then the the second thing that we do that is different, not a lot of other VCs do this. I've never heard anybody say that they do is Oh, actually, I haven't heard a lot of people say, I, I've heard some say this, but um, I actually do outbound sourcing. And what I mean by that is, like the whole advantage of being a sector specialist is that you know what problem sets you're trying to solve for. And so if you know the problem sets that you're trying to solve for, then you can go look out for solutions. And so I'm, I've am i got like a bunch of uh, internal thesis that I have, micro thesis uh, that I've got a list of uh, that I'm always trying to find companies that are solving those problems. So um, we've invested, again, like about five, no, six companies out of the 25 that we've invested in were companies that I did outbound sourcing. I saw someone at speak at an event. I liked their story. I reached out to them. I saw somebody launch their product on Product Hunt. I liked their story. I reached out to them. Um, uh, one person I actually spent, uh, I, I did a deep dive on reading apps and learning loss because of COVID for that particular skill, spoke to 15 companies and then finally invested in in one of those 15. So it's really a lot more about us, about me knowing what I want to invest in, what problem sets I want to go after. And so I do a lot of outbound sourcing also as part of my deal flow. Yeah, yeah I love that. Uh, basically, it's it's amazing that you know what you're, what you're looking for and going out there and getting yeah. it right it's like the proactive approach proactive Absolutely. approach to getting the kind of investments you're looking for uh, because most people are reactive okay we are looking at the emails if we find something interesting we'll react or not yeah, right? yeah. Uh, all right and uh while you're doing this uh because you're open to it inbounds due due diligence becomes really important right so how do you conduct that yeah. The actual, the, the true answer, but also at pre-seed seed stage, there isn't really a lot you can do. I mean, the company is usually just formed like six months ago. Uh, there are no financials. There are no investors. Um, what are you going to diligence, really? Uh, and so honestly, it really comes down to just um, the rapport that you build with the founder. We obviously do um, formal due diligence and, and we make sure that the legal papers are in place. We make sure that the company is properly formed and the founder is a founder's agreement and stock options and all of those things, we make sure that they work. But um, frankly, the, the most important due diligence that you can do is just how do you sort of gel with that person? And that's really um, what we're trying to figure out, especially since, I mean, again, we're investing across jurisdictions across the world. Um, sometimes I don't know the local uh, rules and, and sure, we have a legal team that will go and, and do all of the review. But um, really what you're trying to figure out is, do I trust this person who's sitting in whatever, some small town in Germany? Do I trust this person enough to give this money to them? Um, that's the, the most amount of diligence that you can do. Sure, sure. Yeah, that makes sense. And 
let, let's talk about value add. Uh, and I, I know it's hard as a solo GP to do a lot of value add across different areas. So when it comes to value add, what are the things that you'd like to, that you like to focus on? Yeah. Um, so two ways that we add value. One um, is, is the founder fellowship, which I already really, uh, I mean, I mentioned about being self-aware and one of the pieces that I'm self-aware about is that I don't have um, a wide set of experience across functional areas. And, and so, um, actually creating the founder, the founder fellowship and doing those events was part of that um, process of, of being able to help um, these founders get the right uh, advice um, from someone other than me. So that's that's one way that we do a lot of help uh, and, and value add. The second way that we um, help is just from my personal time. Um, I um, speak to the founders, you know, anywhere from two weeks, once every two weeks to once every quarter, depending on how far along they are. Uh, but those kinds of sessions, uh, I think of myself more as a as an executive coach. So my job really is to ask questions. Um, and and the founder and I, when we're sitting together, he or she, um, I'm trying to basically guide them to to get to an answer. Um, and so that's that's what we're trying to figure out is just how do we um, brainstorm those solutions uh, for these founders. So that's and that's my personal superpower, as I keep, keep saying. My superpower is actually finding a way to connect the dots and brainstorming. So that's what I do with them. Um, so those are the two ways that we add value as a, as a solo GP. Got it. Great, great. And mo- moving to my last main question sure. before we move on to the rapid fire yeah. round, uh, which is uh, what what are the what are some exciting portfolio companies that you'd like to mention ooh, on the podcast? Ooh. Uh, you'd, you'd never <laughs> pick favorites. I don't know. I mean, I would, your listeners would appreciate um, hearing about Vthos, um, which is actually a, a company that is focused on freelancers and creators and actually helps them uh, with uh, financial resources. So that's that's one to keep an eye out on. Um, another one that we've, uh, uh, we invested in last year called Day One um, is another one that I would, I would assume that your readers will appreciate, your listeners will appreciate. Uh, day one is actually a school for entrepreneurs. Um, so they, they run virtual fellowships um, specifically focused on entrepreneurship, um, but not just tech entrepreneurship. These could be any kinds of founders. So you could be, you know, the founder of a brick and mortar shop and, and they will be able to help you um, to do, sort of do your job better. So that's um, uh, that's day one. That's another one that I think um, uh, definitely a lot of the listeners of the podcast might uh, might want to dig into. Yeah, for sure. I'll make sure to plug the links to both sure. those uh, in in the blog post that'll go along with the episode. That's great. All right. So let's now move to the rapid fire round where I'll ask you five quick questions about the fund, mm-hmm. and you have to give five quick sure. answers. Are we up for? Yeah, it? absolutely. Let's go. All right. Yeah. So the first one is sectors and regions you invest in. Uh, sectors: education, future of work, regions globally, except for China, India, and Africa. Uh, anything else is fair game. Uh, what stage you typically invest in? Pre-seed and seed. Those are the only two stages we focus on. What's What's the typical check size? 100 to 150K average check size, US dollars. Uh, where can founders pitch you? Uh, the easiest is to uh, go to our website. There's a button that leads you to an Airtable form. That's the best way to apply. And where can our listeners follow you? Uh, Twitter is probably where I'm most active. So just it's my last name, first name at the rate. So at the rate, Patratin, B-A-T-R-A-A-T-I-N. Um, yeah, just find me on Twitter, send me a DM. Uh, I'm happy to, to engage with people over there. Got it. Uh, I'll make sure to put all the links in the show notes below so that our listeners can get there easily. Awesome. Thank you so much for doing this with me, Athene. It was great talking to you. Happy investing. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Prashant. Thanks for having me. Cheers. My pleasure. My pleasure. Cheers.